Thank you, ma'am. Okay, can everyone hear me? Hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining us for the panel right before lunch. We're all uh, glad to have you here with us. And thanks again to Al Grant for hosting this great event here in beautiful Dubai. My name is Rachel Wolfson. I'm a senior reporter at Cointelegraph, and I'm going to be moderating this panel on payments. Um, before we get started, I'm just going to have the panelists briefly introduce themselves and their company, and then we'll get started with the panel. Thanks, Rachel. Hi, everyone. Chris Scanlon, Group Head of Investor Relations at People, a non-bank financial services technology company focused on the Middle East and Africa. Hello, my name is Sunzar. I'm the founder of Hesab Pay, which is a digital payments platform. Hi, my name is Khaled Muharram, and I head the Middle East North Africa for What's Pay. Great. So the panel is about payments and how the payment revolution is here now. So let's just talk a little bit about crypto and blockchain payments. But first, let's, let's differentiate between the two, and then we'll talk about how um, both of those are advancing payments. So who wants to start off by sure. talking about the differences? I think, thank you, Rachel, for starting up with this uh, great question, because uh, there is a misunderstanding when you say blockchain, people relate that directly to crypto. Crypto is one use case, which can be used in many uh, different industries, but blockchain is far broader than crypto. Blockchain can be used for uh, property ownership, for your car registration, uh, tokenizing, and, and maybe we'll talk later, there's some projects we are doing for tokenizing minerals in Africa. Uh, and when I see the difference between blockchain and database, there is a huge advantage of the technology to be used today. So blockchain, uh, as, as an example, just uh, taking data in general, storage of data. So on database, you can store data for five years, seven years, but then data disappear. Uh, but in blockchain, it's from block zero. So data will always be there. Uh, double spending cannot be done on a blockchain. So that's great because you avoid the fraud and manipulation. With the, there, is, there is many other advantage, but for me, it's the difference between a fax and a mobile phone today. It's limitless blockchain. Chris, did you want to elaborate on that, the differences between blockchain and crypto for payments? Absolutely. Firstly, People addresses an 800 billion uh, market in the Middle East and Africa, mostly who don't have a bank account or are underserved by their financial institution. And how do we solve this problem? Uh, we offer a mobile wallet with a virtual prepaid card, which enables people to load money onto the wallet using our cash agent network and also kiosk network. So if you're unbanked or underserved, you can go from the cash society into the digital society, and then all of a sudden you have that magic 16-digit card number which allows you to use uh, access e-commerce, which is a huge use case in Middle East and Africa. Uh, if you're in the gig economy, you can uh, advertise your business online, uh, pay for services to develop your business, and also, uh, I guess in terms of blockchain, it's, I guess it's an, it's an important point to recognize that it's, it's used as a, as a technology uh, versus uh, digital assets. Uh, and another huge use case we find is remittances. And I think remit remittances can be uh, a little bit misunderstood how, how large an impact they have. For example, development aid is seen as the most important way for emerging economies to increase their prosperity. However, this is greatly outweighed by remittances. Um, so, for example, in Egypt, uh, development aid in 2020 was 1.5 billion, while remittances inflowing into Egypt were 31.5 billion so US dollars. So that is 20, 20 times. And if you look at the transaction costs of remittances, uh, the average is about 7 or 8 percent, which runs transaction costs into the billions. So by using the blockchain technology, removing the double spending and the FX risks, you can charge lower transaction costs while still having a, a healthy margin, because at the end of the day, we need to have a sustainable business uh, to prosper as well. Um, but this drives the transaction cost down for, for the users. And I'll give you a specific example. So a Pakistani national who's an expat here in, in Dubai, I was talking to, he earns 2,000 dirhams a month. Uh, his company pays for his, uh, puts him up in accommodation. 600 dirhams he lives on for food, and then the 1,400 dirhams he sends home every month to his family in Pakistan, and not just his mum and dad and his children, but his, uh, sorry, his wife and his children, but his mum and dad as well. So this 
reduction in transaction costs using the technology really has an impact to the people who really need it in emerging economies. Right. So I guess that leads me into the next topic that I want to discuss now that we know the differences between blockchain as a technology and crypto for payments. Um, let's talk about use cases. So what use cases are we seeing today that are showing, that are demonstrating how blockchain is advancing the payment sector and how cryptocurrency is advancing the payment sector? Sure. So I'll, I'd like to tell you a story. And it's, a, it's one of my favorite stories. It's a true story. It's a story about the London Shoe Company. About 100 years ago, maybe 150 years ago, they sent two salesmen out to Africa. So these two guys, they went separately to Africa and they were trying to see if there was a market for shoes. And the first one came back, he said, ah, forget about it. You know, no one wears shoes in Africa. There's no market there, just forget about it. We can't sell any shoes in Africa. The second guy came back and he said, ah, oh, you're not gonna believe this. No one wears shoes in Africa. We can sell shoes to everyone. So that's kind of how I see that question about use cases. So when we talk about, okay, who's gonna use a blockchain? Who's gonna use this? You actually have to talk about the other side of the equation. There's one and a half billion people in the world that are unbanked or underbanked, right? 40 million of those live in my country, in Afghanistan, right? So to be able to give them access to make payments, to send remittances around the world, to receive donations easily, cheaply, not to have to wait seven hours in line to get a little you know, food to eat. You can do that instantly wherever they are, anywhere in the world, without having to rely on these archaic systems. So use cases are limitless and the potential is also limitless. Uh, to be able to go out there. Right. Do you want to, does anybody want to elaborate on a use case so the audience can better understand? I mean, I, mean, I think that's great. And Chris doing something which impacts people's life is uh, absolutely honorable to, to do. And I think one of the use cases that we try also to ease people's life is, is a project that we just launched for pilgrims who travel every year to Saudi Arabia for Hajj maybe once, but for Umrah on a regular basis. So this a uh, multi-billion dollar industry, uh, and it's done today by cash. So people carry cash with them while traveling. There is an FX, there is a lot of uh, charges operationally to manage this cash uh, d uh, distribution. Uh, and again, this is not very easy to use because as a pilgrim, you could be out of cash at any point of time. So you struggle to get the money in. So tokenizing this money and creating an acceptance solution on a uh, one million post terminal, uh, post uh, point of sale in Saudi Arabia. Uh, we even catered for people who does not have roaming on the internet, so it's a QR based. So even if they're offline, still the payment will be accepted. And then it makes it so easy for them if they're out of cash, they can ask any member of their family back home to upload and put more points or, or tokens uh, into their wallet. Uh, so I think, uh, and again, this thanks to the technology that enable all of this type of innovative uh, product to ease life of, uh, of people. Same like when we talked about remittance. But I think, uh, let me go back to the crypto uh, side of it. Mm -hmm. So crypto today is a locked money. Many people in, uh, in the world buy crypto, but it's not in use. You buy it, you wait for it, grows, etc. So acceptance of crypto itself is another uh, industry that could enable people to use it, actually. And this money, when you think about it from a regulator perspective, this money is outside of the economy. So by enabling the acceptance side, it comes back to the economy. It comes into circulation, uh, back to it. And uh, maybe we'll talk later about stablecoin and the importance of stablecoin when it comes to remittance or even on acceptance because you avoid the volatility of the, the mm. crypto because instantly you convert whatever currency it is, uh, cryptocurrency, to stable token, so you fix the rate. And then the merchant at the end of the day receives fiat into uh, a normal FX. Yeah, I think we should talk about stable coins actually. Let's elaborate on that because uh, Sanzar, I know you had some interesting perspectives on stable coins versus crypto. Do you want to share that? Sure, there's so many countries in the world that when you just mention crypto to them, especially after the, the recent events, that they just have a heart attack. <laughs> They're like, Crypto, you know, crypt, you know, speculative currencies, they don't understand it and they fear what they don't understand. But like Khaled was saying, there's a difference between, you know, blockchain and speculative cryptocurrencies. And particularly on a blockchain, you can do, you know, stable currencies, 
stable coins. And within stable coins, then there's you know, algorithmic and fully reserved. But the, 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 the user doesn't need to understand that. The, what, what the governments need to understand is how you could have digital payments through SWIFT, where you used to work, uh, around to transfer money around the world. Or you could have crypto rails, which is so much faster, cheaper, more secure, more reliable. And so they're not losing any control or power or, you know, to have, to fe have to fear that and have to fear people losing their savings by, you know, volatile uh, cryptocurrencies that are going around. But rather, those c same fiat currencies could be stabilized and made more secure um, through that. So in many countries around the world, uh, actually, it's not, you know, due to SWIFT, but the, the, the countries are being de-risked. Right? So banks are saying, ah, it's not worth our time, uh, it's not worth our risk uh, you know, to, to deal with those countries. And so many of those governments are starting to say, well, maybe we can look at stable coins. Um, that's not speculative, so we don't have as much risk there, but we have all the benefits of having the blockchain. Um, so countries like Iraq, um, Lebanon, Syria, Somalia, and of course where we are in Afghanistan, are looking at ways to be able to get funds into the country, out of the country, um, securely, in a compliant way, reliable, transparent, um, uh, without having to worry about um, you know, all the different uh, drawbacks of using the traditional systems. So for stable coins, we're seeing a huge demand and use case in emerging economies, especially in Africa. If you look at the Nigerian Naira, you look at the Egyptian pound, it's a constant step down uh, due to high inflation and the devaluation of the currencies. Uh, so we're seeing huge demand for people wanting a, a proxy for the dollar so USDT, and often it's, it's the young, technically savvy people who are actually showing their parents, hey, you should be moving your money out of the local currency. There are currency controls in, in many of these countries, and they find a way to get it onto, onto the blockchain, onto uh, a crypto wallet, but again, it's not a digital asset, it's really a proxy for the dollar, uh, which is much, much better for them. Mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing a huge, huge demand for, for, for economies like that. Khaled, do you want to add anything there? Sure. Uh, I mean, I cannot also ignore the fact of what happened in the market with stable coins like Luna, which are based on algorithm. So just to be frank over here and very transparent, a stable coin back to a dollar or back even to gold or whatever it is, is very important to the industry to, to build up the rails and avoid the sudden shocks which, which happen in the market. Uh, and I think this will also bring me that we need in this industry more regulation. And I think we have seen what's happening in the market uh, from ups and downs and some uh, interesting stories happening. But regulation does not come to stop the business. Actually, I see it uh, that when the regulation comes into uh, the industry, it ease up the process, it protects the consumer, which is a very important thing, uh, because you need supervision when, when payment is, is touched, when money is touched. Uh, you need somebody to supervise that, to regulate it, to put terms and conditions, to protect both the consumer, which is the main interest, and also to protect the industry from this type of shocks and uh, uh, instability. Mm -hmm. So I think stablecoin is great. It has many uses. Also for remittance, mm -hmm. it's, it's very important because you want to fix the rate. Uh, on acceptance, it's a pillar because once the purchase is done, you have to convert it immediately because of the volatility of the other uh, currencies. Uh, like you can see the Bitcoin is like uh, uh, a chart which, which goes up and down. So it's definitely a very valuable to the industry, but it needs to be regulated and it needs to be supervised. Right. So. Sanzar, can you share your thoughts on, because you're, you have a stable coin, right? So, and because you're implementing that in certain regions, what has the reaction been from those regions, from the government, for instance, when you tell them about the stable coin? Sure, so um, the government um, in, in many jurisdictions, particularly where we are in Afghanistan, um, you know, try to lump a lot of the things together. So FX of even fiat currencies are considered you know, not to be Sharia compliant. Um, well, cryptocurrencies, they're worried about you know, consumers losing you know, not being protected and losing their, their life savings by trying to, you know, ride certain waves up and down. Um, but then when we go back to Khaled's first point about the difference between blockchain and uh, speculative cryptocurrencies and investing in those and explaining how it's a, um, a secure database. So instead of using a traditional, you know, core banking system on SQL, we're using, um, you know, the Algorand blockchain, which settles, which is more secure, which is more transparent, which is faster in so many different ways. Uh, 
we can bring those benefits in. And once we, we frame it that way and, and we explain the technology around it, then um, a lot more understanding comes into place. And then they can see the benefits for a country, for people, where they can um, very um, easily transact. Um, even without um, having or understanding all the complexities behind it. So most people in the world, you know, the 8 billion people in the world, they're not going to understand the difference between algorithmic stable coin or a fully reserved stable coin. Maybe the people in this room do. Um, but the common uh, you know, user in the world that we're targeting in our niche is, is not someone that necessarily understands that, that might not be financially literate, might not be literate at all, might not have a smartphone, might not have internet access. You know, we, talk, we heard earlier about internet access you know, lacking around the world. Might not even have you know, access to reliable telephone uh, you know, connection. But we can still use the power of the blockchain for that. We issue a small QR code card. Um, so recently, we provided uh, QR code cards to 7,500 widows in Afghanistan, where they didn't need to have you know, a smartphone or understand how blockchain works. They just went to the shop every month with their QR code card, showed the shopkeeper, who took, you know, scanned it and was able to deduct from their Algorand wallet um, the funds that they'd received donation that month. And similarly, mm -hmm. um, you could, you know, scale so quickly in so many parts of the world um, to be able to, to handle it and use the benefits of blockchain without, um, you know, g getting into that fear and that confusion about, um, uh, you know, the, the, uh, about, you know, that's around the word crypto itself. That itself the word itself is very... Um, uh, you know, strange to a lot of people that, because they don't understand it. So when you explain, hey, it's just a card, you could have a, you know, another payment card or you can have this payment card and it's kept in a secure database, that really um, uh, solves a lot of problems and helps um, uh, not only governments but the general public um, uh, uh, allay their fears. Right. Um, now we're also, you guys mentioned remittances. Can we talk a little bit about why blockchain is an efficient system for remittances versus like traditional uh, systems that we're seeing today? Yeah, absolutely. So I guess the blockchain network that we use is a replacement of the Swift network, which is really archaic uh, from experience. But what the blockchain essentially allows us to do is to uh, get our partners and ourselves onto the blockchain, onto the same system, and then settle the transaction instantly, remove counterparty risk, and also FX risk if we pipe in uh, Thomson Reuters API, and that allows us, as I said before, to really reduce the transaction costs, and also to, to allow to settle the payment instantly, which reduces a lot of the anxiety for users. You know, is my money gonna end up with the recipient? Is it gonna be the same amount that I sent uh, at the point of transaction versus the person at the receiving end? So I think blockchain is a very much more efficient, uh, transparent, and, and speedy way of, of cross-border remittances. Right. Um, I forget if it was Khaled or Chris, but somebody was also mentioning that blockchain for remittances is safer in terms of, like, for women, for instance, when mm. they go to get money, but blockchain actually enables safety. Does somebody want to mention that use case? I think that's interesting. Uh, sure. Yeah. sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I, ah, it's, okay. it's, it's it definitely us. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it is, um, you know, uh, safer in, in, in many different ways um, because you can also protect identity. Um, a lot of the traditional ways, if, if in countries where SWIFT doesn't work at all, mm. um, then they, give, they print out the lists of names of people, how much they're going to receive, and they have to give those papers to one another. And so you have Hawala dealers and you have many other people in the chain, you know, dealing with personal identifiable information. And so um, that has a lot of risks. There's, there can be interference, there's fraud, waste and abuse, you know, to many different ways. But if you could um, do that all on the blockchain, um, you could prove the transaction, you know, took place and you could, you know, cash out without having any personal information available. So um, even the processor doesn't need to know, uh, you know, personal information about a, a certain family, their condition, their, you know. Uh, so especially in war zones even, or in um, areas where, you know, uh, you know, there's different faction parties or, uh, you know, political rivals. Uh, sometimes, you know, funds and grants can be, you know, held up in different ways. But being able to use the blockchain, um, you're able to protect 
the consumer, you're able to you know, protect the environment, um, and when you're providing that aid, they're doing it in an anonymous and, uh, and way, with dignity. Uh, instead of having to go and kind of beg and say, okay, I'm waiting in line, now give me this, you're at home and you get funds to your phone and you can go directly to the shop as opposed to, you know, imagine uh, a mother of five waiting in line for seven hours every month just to get a bit of money to be able to feed her kids, as opposed to immediately going to the shop and receiving it on the blockchain. So it, it, safety is, is really, really paramount and, and, and then it, it saves money for even the centers because it's not just them waiting in seven lines, it's all the administrators and security to try to protect a big crowd of people you know, trying to collect um, uh, money or food or interference from outside parties that want you know, to add their own beneficiaries to a certain list. So in, in so many different ways, um, it, it protects the entire uh, chain the people, the government, the end user, the consumer, and the donors to make sure that what they want to give ends up to people that need it most. Right. Um, so we've talked about a variety of use cases now. Let's talk about the challenges that may hamper adoption because while these use cases are really innovative, um, I think that mainstream adoption, education, regulations, compliance, all of these are challenges. So I want you guys to discuss those challenges and how we may overcome those. I think one of the main challenges is uh, interoperability because uh, blockchain by nature work in silos. So you need to build up the bridges between the different players within that ecosystem to have uh, a solution which is fast to the market and capture for many things. Like as an example, when we work with Algorand uh, on the project in Saudi Arabia, that's because it's a Sharia compliant, so it address uh, a major thing. Uh, again, the other point, which is the TPS, the transaction per second. And I remember in the opening, uh, you have seen that the TPS have went from 1K to 6K. So that's scalability of the product uh, or the ecosystem. And there is one which is a bit underestimated uh, in, in the industry so far, uh, which I think we put it as a priority when we built up the ecosystem, is the compliance solution. Because you need to filter, you cannot just ignore that. You need to filter the sanction screening list. You need to avoid anti-money laundry. You need to look at the fraud detection. So if you don't have a robust compliance mm. uh, system in place connected to that, and also the, the main challenge is to connect the old world to the new world. So again, that's all bridges. Uh, but if you don't have all of this, you, you will hit into a crash, trust me. And, and you see this happening in the market today. Yeah. So you have to build all of that very carefully. It takes a long time. But the objective at the end of the day is to give to the customers, uh, consumers, uh, P2B, whatever it is, an ecosystem which is fast to the market, secure, addressing the compliance and risk management uh, issues. I think that's uh, one of the main uh, challenge within the industry. Right, what about mainstream adoption? Sanzar and Chris, you can probably both talk about that, but is it, has it been challenging pushing these solutions out to regions where people may not know about crypto or blockchain, how are you getting them to use these solutions if they know nothing about what they're using? Or maybe they do know, I don't know. I think that's a challenge. I think the world's demographics are, are, are kind of reversing. So a lot of people were thinking, you know, people in the West or in Europe or, you know, for example, in Japan, that's where, you know, the cutting out of, edge of technology is. Um, but if you just look at the demographics of the world right now, those populations are aging very, very quickly. They're not having a lot of kids. And Africa, Middle East, India, the, the youth are, are rapidly, uh, you know, exceeding the elderly. In Afghanistan, in my country, 77% of the population is under the age of 25. 77%. So how many 25-year-olds do you know that don't know how to use a smartphone or don't know, you know, they, they grab it. My two-year-old daughter is, is, is hacking my phone now. I mean, the, the, the rate of adoption for, for the use of massive, and that's going to be where the, where the potential is. So in Africa, Chris and I were talking about earlier, the... That's the, the, as soon as you kind of just hint it to them and they can then figure it out and they can run with it um, so much. So the, the future is really in the emerging markets, in the developing economies, and we haven't seen any problems. Even with people that are literate, they can figure out, okay, if I need to feed my kid and I need to you know, do this and this and I'll go to that store, they'll, they'll figure that out. Uh, but getting that word out, um, uh, making sure that you know, the, the governments, I think that's where more interoperability, making sure that we can work with everyone else, 
There are so many different systems, even in this room or with Algorand, I'm learning about all these incredible products. Um, if we could all work together to integrate our own systems, that would be huge uh, to be able to offer so much more functionality, revenue lines, so much more um, you know, benefit to the people that use it. Right. Yeah, and I think it's important to note that in developed economies, the fintechs that have emerged as, as the winners in their regions are really providing a service for people who are already banked, and it's a supplementary service, whereas in the Middle East and Africa, it's really not uh, a want, it's a need. These people really need these things to, to, to prosper, to need innovative technologies. So I think it's important to note that. And in terms of challenges, uh, COVID has really driven uh, change in people's behaviours. We've all had to change, we've all established new habits of working remotely and, and other things, but despite that, there are still uh, people who go to the local exchange house, it's a social event, they go and queue up, they send their money home at the local exchange house and they pay exorbitant rates. And it's comfortable, it's a habit, and it's really up to us to educate them about these technologies so they're comfortable with them, uh, you know, have community and salespeople going down there and really educating them on, on what the technology can do for them, how it's going to reduce their transaction costs. And I think that's uh, to change consumer behaviour and also to, I guess, create new habits and a new lifestyle for them that's going to enable them to prosper as well. Yeah. One more thing I, just to mention about that. Um, I, I, I have some work in the U.S., and when I go there, many times they're like, oh, send me a check. So they want me to write out a check and put it in the post mail and mail it to them, and reconciliation, you know, a couple weeks later, uh, which is just maddening because that's how, and, you know, many f houses are still connected with, you know, traditional phone lines. Um, but then you go to other places in Africa or in Afghanistan, where I'm from, where they've just leapfrogged straight to, you know, 4G and 5G technology. Like, it's, it's such a, a, a big leapfrog. And so similarly, I, I think most of the innovation the cutting edge is going to come in, in, the, in the areas that were the, the least, you know, uh, served earlier. So, you mm -hmm. know, parts of Africa jumped straight to mobile money. Yes. Um, and, and similarly, I think a lot of the innovation in Algorand and the future of, of blockchain is going to happen in those communities because they're going to leapfrog over the traditional systems because they're going to go straight to the new ones. They're not going to be, yeah. they're, they're not going to have the old institutions of checks and, yes. you know, dial up internet to be able to get over that, but they're going to go straight to what works, the fastest, cheapest, best alternative. And yeah. Africa is the fastest, you know, growing region in the world in terms of population. So. Yeah. The innovation will drive adoption of, of digital ways of, exactly. of paying for things, and that will drive uh, prosperity and economic development, and also attract more investment. So I think I really agree that emerging markets is, is the best place to deploy, deploy capital. You know, we're in the right place at the right time in the right sector, and I think it's only just getting started. Exactly. Maybe if I just add to, to this, and I totally agree that also the region over here have took some important steps from a regulation perspective. So today you have regulators like uh, Abu Dhabi Global Market, uh, VARA in, in Dubai, which is the Virtual Asset Regulatory Authority, Central Bank of Bahrain have already issued some regulation around it. And I think that's very important because today everybody who play within this industry come and have a presence over here because the regulator is doing something with it. So Avoiding regulator, for, for me, that's a, just a simple summary. Avoiding regulation is a mistake, and for both for the consumer and for the technology provider. Having a regulator who's innovative and thinking, brainstorming, there's many sessions happening in Dubai for the past uh, six months, one year with the regulator to understand what we want to achieve, what they want to achieve, etc. But having the regulator playing his role within this industry is very important, and I think this region is blessed by having three regulators so far uh, issuing uh, uh, regulation, guidance, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I agree, which is why I think it's the perfect place, Dubai, to host an event like this, yeah. because a lot of innovation is happening here. Um, and it's important because I think that we're going to see regions like Dubai and the Middle East drive innovation in other regions like the U.S., I think that we're going to start seeing those use cases for payments with blockchain and cryptocurrency and stable coins happen here um, and actually be used versus happening in the U.S. Yeah. Where, I'm, where I live. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and maybe just collaboration because we talked about it and, and thanks to Algorand to bring all of us over here. But this panel is a real example. So from yesterday we are discussing three of us mm -hmm. and we see that we complement each other. Mm -hmm. 
and we actually built up some use cases that we have discussed. We just met yesterday, and, and like it's amazing to find uh, great uh, brains and uh, great solutions and link that together and collaborate on a, a network which is scalable uh, like Algorand. Right. Khalid, you, you bring up a really good point. Collaboration is key within this industry. And I, I would love to hear more about how you guys think it's beneficial to collaborate with the solutions that you're bringing to market. So maybe just explain that a little Super. bit more. So I think one of the examples and uh, when, when we start talking the project of pilgrims in Saudi Arabia, the acceptance uh, in general, it have attracted Sanzar also and, and uh, Chris. Uh, and Pakistan, Afghanistan, APAC in general, is the sending country. So this is where the pilgrims come from, the high numbers. So you have the largest number comes from Indonesia, followed by Malaysia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the QR, the, the whole solution that we built is built up on a QR code with a mobile wallet. But the QR card also is brilliant mm. because uh, many does not have a mobile phone, like uh, Sensor have mentioned. So they have already the reach from the, what I would call the issuance country or the sending country. And they have a solution already in place, which is the card that we can integrate easily with the post terminal over there. Uh, with Chris, we were talking again about, uh, because they are helping people with the remittance, uh, the buy and off ramp of uh, digital assets, et cetera, et cetera, because we ha have built up an ecosystem which is interoperable, so we are connected to many uh, you can get a preferred rate. The consumer, at the end of the day, will get a preferred rate. I don't want to talk much in details about it because <laughs> it's an initial discussion we had uh, together. But I see the collaboration and I yes. see the add value between the three uh, companies. Absolutely. I think QR codes are also impressive in reducing transaction costs for merchants since if you accept payments through a card, then there's all sorts of transaction costs uh, with, with MasterCard and, and Visa. So for these developing economies to reduce those transaction costs using QR codes is really powerful. And in terms of collaboration, uh, you know, on our, we, we've got a very interesting view, obviously, on stable coins and digital assets down the road. So we'd love to collaborate on that. And in terms of Afghanistan, um, you know, really focusing on that, that pipeline between uh, the Afghans internationally who want to send money home to help their families out. Exactly. Then Sanzara and I are talking about that as well. And I think the Algorand and Decipher conference is a great way for people to collaborate. I was just talking to someone last night who works with farmers in Nigeria and gets them on the social media platform to enable them to sell their produce using social media, uh, on a, on a, using e-commerce and accept payments for that. And we're talking together as well about how we can use his acquisition channel, our payment uh, network and infrastructure, and also Algorand using the technology platform to make it um, to make it efficient. So I think that's a great way that we, example of how we can collaborate as well. I, I mean, I think almost every different app on Algorand, every different use case has a network effect. So the more users you have, then that attracts more users, especially in the, in the payments uh, arena. You know, it's both merchants and users. The more merchants you have, that allows more users. The more users you have, then the more urgents. So it has this kind of network effect that keeps growing and growing and growing. And collaboration is the best way to, be, to achieve that. Instead of reinventing the wheel in every country, in every jurisdiction, in every government, in every use case, there are so many different amazing use cases here that we can integrate with each other and and, and enable them uh, you know, to be able to use each other and help grow each other. And so don't ever be afraid of competition. Oh, someone else is doing that exact same thing or mm -hmm. doing that there or, or whatnot. Uh, actually, the more you can find people, the more you can you know, discuss and collaborate with them, that's going to grow the entire uh, ecosystem. It's going to be much easier for me to have you know, someone that uses people already to use Hasab Pay as opposed to someone off the street that's never heard of you know, digital payments. Um, so likewise, the more you can do that. And things that you might have you know, no idea of how they might work together, they do actually do work. We were talking about climate change yesterday, where, the, where this company that I met here at Algorand creates these devices that connect to solar panels. And they then count and certify carbon credits from those solar panels. So in Afghanistan, we have over 100 containers a day of solar panels coming in. So massive amount of you know, renewable energy. And they could monetize that. But then I'm like, well, how do you pay them once they've, you know, proven that they own those carbon credits. Well, you could connect with us at Saab Pay and you can instantly give them you know, payment every day for, for doing that. So in so many different ways, if we can, uh, even within the Algorand community, uh, collaborate, it, it, will, it will have 
tremendous network effects to exponentially grow. Right, yeah, collaboration is key, that's for sure. Um, I just wanna end our panel by asking you guys what you think the future of blockchain and crypto payments are, and do you think that will, how do you think it will impact traditional payment systems? Are those just going to disappear in the coming years, or, or you know, what are your thoughts on that? Sure, uh, I, I, this, this reminds me, like maybe some 25 years back, uh, you said the story, I also like to say the same story over here. And I don't know how many years were born 25 years ago, so, but people who did not see a mobile phone, if at the time when the mobile phone as a technology did not exist and I tell somebody I will have a device and not connect it to a wire and make a call, and not only this, but even if I'm traveling, I'll make a call, he'll say, you must be good. Because it was unbelievable that this technology will take over. Today, I think you can leave home without your wallet, without your passport, without your ID, but you cannot leave home without your mobile phone. And I see the same is happening today, and it's not uh, uh, the future. I, I see this happening today itself. The, the move from the database technology to a blockchain technology, this is happening. There is thousands of DeFi projects that already live today. It's not coming in, in, in few years, but it's actually happening today. Uh, you have the same on, on blockchain. So many of this is happening. And I see this will be tomorrow norm. So tomorrow, I see that blockchain will be the norm as the mobile is today. It will be a necessity, not a luxurious uh, technology that we will talk about. Everything will be built up on, on a blockchain. Yeah, I, I particularly see in, in point-of-sale devices in the payments network. So traditionally you have you know, those big point-of-sale devices where you swipe your card or put in your chip, right? Um, and, and the future is going to be every smartphone is going to be a point-of-sale device. So every merchant, you don't need to have, you know, pay a $500 separate device to put on and, and process payments. But every single person that has a cell phone, that's a pause device where you can tap to pay or you can um, you know, tap from a phone to phone, tap to pay, not, not necessarily even having a card. Um, so that's, that, there's, I still think there are going to be cards and still going to be, you know, pause devices and everything else in the future, but it'll be just like you mentioned with the phones. There, there are fax machines in the world, but they're just very, very few. There are, you know, wired phones in the world, but just much fewer. So similarly, payments is all going to be um, on the blockchain, all going to be, um, you know, from, from phone pause devices uh, in the future. Great. Agree, there's going to be an increased adoption of innovative technologies such as blockchain. I think during the process, there is still going, and there still is, going to be multiple layers that cause uh, transaction costs for companies to be quite high, and therefore that has to be passed on to the consumer. Um, blockchain is helping that right now, but there are still uh, multiple layers that are being built up. And I think as we go forward through the years, there is going to be some sort of com uh, consolidation. There's also going to be increased M&A activity, which is only going to help, I think, yeah. just to streamline the industry as we, as we emerge. Right. Great. Well, we've got two minutes left. So if anybody has a question, I think we have time for, for one question. So feel free to ask. I see a hand in the back. So we'll probably have time just for this question. Then you guys can ask us other questions after the panel. Hello. Can you hear me? Maybe you can shout, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> There's another mic. Okay. Hello, yeah, you can hear me? Perfect. Yes. Uh, so this has been super interesting, so thank you for doing this. Uh, I'm asking this question as a person who was in Iraq, who escaped the war and went to the UK, so I'm seeing both of these kind of conditions. So the first question which uh, I'm gonna go for is regarding the anonymous uh, way where you take acceptance for um, in Afghanistan, which is for us when we were doing the rationing, uh, ration cards where you go take your ration card and you get, you know, uh, one kilogram of f flour or whatever. Uh, we, we didn't have a facility to actually authenticate that this ration card actually uh, belongs to that specific person. So when you talked about anonymous, I'm interested how would you solve that kind of fraud behavior if that happens. That's the first question, sorry. And the second question is um, uh, regarding like how would you uh, 
uh, encourage people to come to using your products. So for example, right now, online banking has been here for a long time, but you can s still see the older generation, specifically my parents from Iraq, who I barely convinced to use the iPhone a couple of years ago, <laughs> where they were stuck with their you know, uh, solid Nokia device uh, for a long time. And uh, yeah, so how would you solve these challenges? Would, how would, that, would that be within your responsibility as a yes. product owner to do that? Um, same thing, for example, in Barclays when they do their advertising saying, hey, come to our uh, offices and we will uh, teach you all the generation on how to do online banking and that kind of stuff. So I'm interested in how you're going to fix these very tricky issues. Thank you. Very good questions. And, and you hit you know, the, the issue, you know, the nail right on the head. Um, so that, that's a fantastic question. The, uh, the, the, in Afghanistan, we have something called the biometric ID where they've already issued eight and a half million of them, um, and they're issuing about 10,000 a day more of them. So these IDs are, have you know, 10 fingerprints, you know, iris scan, you know, facial recognition, and so we can issue accounts or create Algorand wallets, one wallet for each biometric ID. That's how we can make sure that person is identified there. To make a payment, in, some, if in case someone steals your QR code card and goes about it, uh, right now we're, we're requiring all transactions be validated with an OTP. So um, almost all of our users have at least one in one of those Nokia, uh, you know, feature phones per family. And so um, we, can, we, can, we link their phone number to their account as well. And whenever they're making a transaction, uh, let's say you want to buy 100 Afghani of flour from a certain store, they get a one-time passcode to that phone on that registered account with that biometric ID. And they have to give that four-digit code to the merchant to complete the transaction. That way we authenticate them. Um, uh, we make sure that it's them that's there. Their account is linked to a biometric ID, so people can't double dip and create multiple accounts or, or fraud uh, to be able to do so. So it's a very, very important question, um, but we are lucky that we have those IDs in Afghanistan. Um, there are also ways to do that you know, uh, on the blockchain to kind of verify people's IDs. There's the Global ID, another platform that, that, that we, we spoke to in other countries that, that are looking to, to verify people's identity in that form um, or another. Um, we're lucky that we have 27 million in regular phones and only about nine and a half million smartphones, but the, the future is all going towards smartphones as well. So it's double digit increases every year, which is massive. And that's where the future, even in Africa, is going to be yes. on, on smartphones as well. Yeah. So the way we get the word out is through digital marketing, di digital acquisition, but how do we get to the older generation who aren't as tech savvy? And I think that's through, like I mentioned before, the younger generation. So in Egypt, particularly the younger generation are telling their parents you have to do this because it, 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 it can't just be left to you know, keeping your money in the local currency, they have to tell them. And how do we enhance that? So creating family and, and community uh, features on, the, on our platform, on our mobile app, so you can have multiple cards, you can have multiple ways of paying and, and loading uh, channels of money on the platform, so then the younger generation uh, can run it, and then the older generation can, can also access those facilities, or, or even children, children and uh, you know, parents and their children can access it as well. So that's one way that we address that, and we see that being addressed in somewhere like Egypt. Cool. Well, we are out of time. If you guys have other questions, please find us. Um, thank you again for joining us. Thanks again to Algorand. It's been such a pleasure, and yeah, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks. Thank you.